human brain is a wondrous machine. Literally from birth, our brains are exploring, reacting and mirroring the world around us. A mother's loving eyes, a soft caress, a gentle comforting voice. With every interaction, every experience, our brain creates connections. Respected researchers say our brains are sculpted by our early experiences. When those experiences are positive, in nurturing and responsive relationships, we flourish. But when early experiences are stressful, fearful, or traumatic, things can go terribly wrong. Trauma harms the brain. This is not a software issue. This is a hardware issue. In this video, we hope to deepen your understanding of how fear and stress and various types of trauma undermine the structure, the wiring, and the chemistry of a child's brain, putting the child at risk for a lifetime of social learning and behavioral problems. This is good information for anyone who cares for a child with a history of trauma, but it's crucial for parents of adopted and foster children, the vast majority of whom have suffered some kind of early harm. We'll help you understand how altered brain development can trigger what looks like bad behavior. You'll learn there's a big difference between won't and can't behaviors in fragile children whose brains were formed under stress and fear. We understand that these behaviors are so perplexing and confusing and sometimes even maddening, but there's great hope. And we're here to explain to you what science knows about how to change the chemistry of fear in your child to a chemistry of hope and healing. Just as trauma harms the brain, research shows positive experiences in trusting relationships can heal the brain. Is there any chance I could trade you a hug? Okay. Okay. That concept is at the core of a unique holistic intervention and I'm wondering if we created by Dr. Karen Purvis and her colleague, Dr. David Cross, at the TCU Institute of Child Development. A developmental psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. Purvis is an internationally recognized leader in the field of post-adoption care who has devoted her life to helping children with histories of trauma. You have a lot of things that hurt, don't you? She calls them children from hard places. Based on more than a decade of research, doctors Purvis and Cross have developed a program called TBRI, or Trust-Based Relational Intervention. It's about empowering parents and caregivers to help children overcome the impact of trauma. How are you feeling? I'm and reach their full potential. It all starts with building trust. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, what would you like? As we connect to this child, as we build safety, as we let them know they're precious, we actually change the brain chemistry. We've documented this and published it in numerous journals. Not only chemistry, we change the wiring of the brain. We change the development of the brain. For that child whose history took him far off course, we know how to bring them back. As recently as the 1980s, scientists believed a child's brain at birth was fairly static, largely predetermined by genetics. Researchers now know that's not true. While genetics clearly play a role, scientists know that relationships and experiences shape the brain. Think of a developing brain like a multi-storied house under construction. In this chapter, we'll explore the basics of brain development and help you understand how early traumatic experiences can design a different house. When we're born, our brains are teeming with more than 100 billion neurons or brain cells. Under optimal conditions, when our needs are met consistently by nurturing caregivers, we got a red ball. our brains thrive. These neurons connect in complex and vast networks, much like the electrical wiring in a modern home. The baby comes with all this wiring, but it's the human interaction looking into the eyes, being held, hearing the song of my mother, feeling the strong shoulder of my daddy, that began to make the brain develop in very, very important ways. 
for all of the life skills that will come. At birth, the lower floors, or the downstairs part of the brain, is firmly wired in place by genetics, allowing a child to breathe, eat, sleep, and hear. Survival functions are rooted here. Very few connections in the upper floors are formed. These more sophisticated parts of the brain govern higher functions, complex thought, reasoning, emotional processing, memory, speech, and most importantly, the ability to regulate our behavior. It takes time and repeated experiences for this circuitry to develop and become hardwired in the brain. When a child experiences trauma, abuse, neglect, or other risk factors, it can skew the wiring of the brain, as well as the structure and the chemistry. The lower, more primitive survival part of the brain can overdevelop from reacting to fear, while the critical upper floors may underdevelop and suffer. In the book that I wrote with Dan Siegel, The Whole Brain Child, we talk about an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. For some kids... Dr. Bryson is a psychotherapist at Pediatric and Adolescent Psychology Associates, Director of Parenting Education for the Mindsight Institute in California, and best-selling author along with Mindsight Executive Director, Dr. Dan Siegel. The upstairs brain is the more sophisticated part of the brain. It's our cortex that takes a long, long time to develop. And it's the part of the brain that allows us to regulate our emotions and calm down our bodies, understand ourselves, understand other people, and really be able to make good choices and be flexible and adaptive. The downstairs brain is much more primitive. It's actually really well developed at birth. And it's the limbic area and the brain stem connected to the body. And that part of the brain is much more reactive. And its job is to kind of constantly be watching for how to keep us alive. Dr. Bryson's research and studies in attachment science, child rearing theory, and interpersonal neurobiology have made her a sought after expert contributor with appearances on Good Morning America, PBS, and Red Book Magazine. She says trauma triggers the watchdog part of the lower brain, called the amygdala, to work overtime. And its job is to constantly sort of scan the environment, to be paranoid a little bit, to be watching, is, is everything okay here? Am I okay? Am I safe? Is anyone out to get me? Can I relax? And that part of the brain is always appraising what's going on around us, reading faces, reading the environment. Do you like bubblegum? Yeah. No. Yeah. When children feel threatened or overwhelmed with fear, they may fight, run away, or shut down. The brain kicks into survival response, which researchers called fight, flight, or freeze survival mode. If the brain stays in this state too long because of trauma, it reorganizes around survival at the expense of healthy development of other parts of the brain. So for a child who's had repeated exposure to fearful experiences, whether those be sort of a trauma like a car accident, or whether it's developmental or relational trauma, where the caregiver was frightening, or they were left for long periods of time to manage their own fear states. The downstairs brain has gotten a lot of practice being active. It's the repeated experiences that we have that actually activate growth and connection in the brain. So if a child has had a lot of experiences where their downstairs brain that was reactive and fearful, that part of the brain gets really well developed. Whereas then the upstairs brain that knows how to calm that fear and kind of do that self-soothing like, oh, that was a scary noise, but I'm okay now. That part of the brain may not be as well developed in children who have had repeated fearful experiences. Even though our brains can seem like computers, hardwired into complicated networks, they are not machines. The brain is a living, growing organ. And as Dr. Bryson explains, it has an enormous capacity for change. One of the biggest fears that parents have is that they've already messed up or that their child has sort of been wired in their brain in a way that is going to be terrible for the rest of their lives. But what's really exciting and what we know from the studies on neuroplasticity is that the brain is so open to change. And what's so great about that is that when we have different experiences, the brain changes in response to those experiences. Remember, repeated experiences shape the brain. 
The brains of children from hard places were formed by stress and fear from unmet needs and harmful experiences. Can you remember use your big voice if you need me, right? Okay. Can you show me? Mommy! There you go, and I'll <laughs> come right away, okay? You have the opportunity to reshape your child's brain. Thank you. You're welcome. Through nurturing, repeated, positive experiences, the basis of attachment.